Who'd like to read? Somebody new. Adam. Well, let's let's have two new ones. He can slap you upside the head if you don't do a good job. <coughs> Because of the nature of this topic and because of its foundational importance, I've decided to split it into two parts. Believe it or not, I do try to avoid parts one and two. Uh, These studies go on long enough as it is. Um, But on this one, not only is this important, but it includes concepts that may not be grasped easily in one telling. So along with spreading it out to allow uh, allow time for, uh, as I finish this, the next session, stop that. (laughs) Um, I thought, well, this, this is, we're pushing it as far as time. Let's split it in two. Maybe we'll have time for questions, comments. I've expanded the information in the handout, uh, and perhaps more than usual, you may also benefit from obtaining the complete notes for these two sessions. Now, I am in no way casting aspersions on anyone's intelligence. My reasoning is that if it took me several readings of some of the source material to grasp the information there, then it's a reasonable assumption that it may not take hold for you in just one telling. And the last thing I want to do is to rush through this. If, as Scripture makes clear, no one or no thing can add anything to our utterly complete and holy God, well, we might rightly wonder why then he went to the bother of creating the universe, the earth, and human beings to dwell on that earth. Why, why did he do that? To reach some understanding of why God created all there is, and for the sake of this argument, created especially human beings. I'll lean heavily upon the Jonathan Edwards classic treatise, a dissertation concerning the end for which God created the world, published in 1765. Along with John Piper's extremely helpful discussion about Edwards' dissertation. In his book, God's Passion for His Glory, 1998. Now both of these both of these books are available the books are available also from various sources there there are free versions of these two uh books the the first is not really a book it's literally a treatise it's often by Jonathan Edwards um or a dissertation um it's often combined with another one so you get the package of the two there it's freely available. You can do a search. You can buy the book or you can just find it. Uh, Piper's book is more often than not available for free, but uh, from his website you also can download a PDF of it. Now I, I must frankly admit at the top that I find Edward's treatise extremely dense and challenging to digest your brain starts to hurt reading it. And since John Piper saw fit to publish a companion book on Edward's work, which does indeed assist the poor plebe struggling to comprehend it, I must not be the only one struggling with it. Yet I confess, I've always found some of even John Piper's books to be almost as thickly and thickly composed and reasoned as Edwards. That probably says more about me than John Piper. So his book, helping us understand Edwards' book, is in some instances is faint help. Thus, for the sake of this study, as well as my own sanity, I've done my best to whittle down to the ad, uh, whittle down the admirable work of both of these eminent scholars. 
to their essential points. Because in the final analysis, Jonathan Edwards does indeed make a profound, well-reasoned argument for the reason God created the world. But let me begin with something Piper writes. Quote, God's moral rectitude consists in his valuing the most valuable, namely, himself. God's moral rectitude consists in his valuing the most valuable, namely, himself. Rectitude just means according to moral principles, strict honesty, uprightness of character. In a word, righteousness or rightness. This introduces a critical perspective for us to consider and adopt. To wit, that which is reprehensible conceit or presumptuous vanity in man is in God nothing less than proof of his deity and holy righteousness. And that's, it's it's hard to digest that, to chew on that. Why, Why is it so horrible for us, but it's all right for God? For example, were I to mount the platform on a Sunday morning to sing a solo or perform on an instrument or deliver a sermon for the sole purpose of basking in the adulation of the congregation, that is, to be glorified in their midst, then you would rightly condemn my conceit and be right to encourage my repentance for such sinful pride. Absolutely. Yet that is a fairly accurate human illustration of God's character and behavior. His ultimate end in all things is to glorify Himself. Period. In mere human beings, that is self-centered conceit. In God, it is the sublime demonstration of His righteousness or rightness or rectitude. We can rightly agree, as did Jesus Himself, that God is the ultimate expression of every righteous quality. To the rich young ruler who greeted Jesus with, Good teacher! Jesus responded, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Mark 10, 17-18 By this, Jesus meant that God is by nature a level of good unattainable for anyone else. In comparison to His, our good is like something one would scrape off the bottom of one's shoe. Or, alternatively, as Calvin interpreted Jesus' reply, quote, Thou falsely calleth me a good master, unless thou acknowledgest that I have come from God. That's good. Now let's consider the nature of God in this context. Other cosmogenies or theories or accounts of the origin or generation of the universe. So cosmogony is just a theory on how it, the universe was created. Other cosmogenies invariably emphasize that the living beings are created by the gods for the gods. Man is little more than a useful servant of the creator's needs. As detailed in one of the more famous pagan accounts, the Babylonian or so-called Chaldean Genesis, unearthed and subsequently published in 1876. Emerging victorious after a struggle among the gods is the Babylonian deity Marduk, who, quote, compounds material of his own blood for the creation of man, the chief purpose of whose creation is that the service of the gods may be established. End quote. Although it's true, yes, that our God created man to worship and serve him. Yes. We see in the creation account in Genesis, as well as the rest of God's word, 
that our God loves and serves man. We see it in the progression of his creative acts. He builds a universe and an earth. He outfits the earth, preparing it for the benefit of his, its highest creature, man. He's sensitive to man's lack of companionship, so God creates a companion for him. We see it in his establishment and love for Israel. Isaiah 43, 3-4. His long-suffering and grace throughout the span of his creation on earth. Historically, gods, like most kings, ruled through fear. Adherents would make offerings and sacrifices to appease the ever-present anger of their god. Our god, while not compromising one ounce of his omnipotence and majesty, rules through love. His wrath is reluctantly displayed only as a last resort when the good he desires for his people is repeatedly thwarted by their sinful rebellion. Everything God does is good. Everything God is, is good. His good, not our good. Thus, His creation will be good. Genesis 1, 4-31, 1 Timothy 4-4. Four, four. One of my favorite verses in Scripture, and one profound in its succinct declaration is Romans 11.36 For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. That verse pretty much says it all. We can almost place the period at the end of this session and go home to our pot roast. Does anybody do that anymore? Over here, we do that once in a while. Once in a while. I could smell it from the drive when we came home from church. First, the context makes clear that the hymn in the verse refers to God, theos, the Greek theos, also as the Lord, kurios. This verse is another way of stating that God is the first and the last. And Edwards has something to say about that. Here's what he writes. When God is so often spoken of as the last as well as the first, the end as well as the beginning, it is implied that as He is the first, efficient cause and fountain from whence all things originate, so he is the last, final cause for which they are made. The final term to which they all tend in their ultimate issue. So let's, let's break this verse down. For from him, God is the source, the only source of all things. And through him, God is the sole channel through which all things are generated. And to him are all things. God, and this is this is the this is the punchline from Edwards, Jonathan Edwards. God is his own end. To him be the glory forever. God's end, his ultimate end or purpose, if you will is His own glory. And the verse closes, Amen. Truly, so let it be. Bank on it. While this passage is Father or Godhead centric, the Apostle Paul states essentially the same thing about Christ Jesus, specifically in his letter to the Colossians. Let's look at that. 
Colossians chapter 1. Mm -mm. You didn't pay attention last week. Wait till we turn. Be patient. It's tough breaking these in. Why, if we just had the same crowd at, for year after year, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be such a labor. Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17. Go at them. Now, that's enough. No, you're right. You're right. Go ahead. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's the punchline. That's the best part. <laughs> Pardon me. Got ahead of myself. Now, it's not explicit from the verses we read, but it's speaking of Christ. And I love that last phrase that I almost didn't let him read. Jesus holds the universe in his hands. This is just incredible. He, he says he's before all things. He holds all things together. <laughs> Thank you for that cliche. Uh, the, it, it's, this universe is not in chaos. Not that it ever was created as chaos. It, I'm not saying that. But the reason it is not chaos now is that Jesus is holding it together. He orders it. He is the one who holds it all together. And it says, All things have been created through Him and for Him. Now, we... Does anyone want to... Jump in here. Let me before I continue. Greg, I was just going to say I believe from my past learning that uh, scientifically there are the body, everything is made of up atoms, and they all the opposites attract. Uh, but there is within the atom, uh, I believe electrons. Uh, I'm going to say this wrong because <coughs> it's been too long. But, but they <laughs> aspects of the atom that, that is that defies everything that the scientists know uh, or think they know or think they know and, and so electrons are attracted to electrons indescribably and uh, and theologians will say when it says that Jesus holds all things together that's evidence of it right there that if Jesus one day and he will one day not hold things together, then all these Oof. atoms are going to uh, uh, explode, and, and that will be everything, because everything is made of atoms. And that's a good point, because when I think of that, I always think of the universe, the the, the cosmic universe. Uh, but you're right; it's down to the tiniest thing that he's holding together. If he weren't doing that, it'd blow apart. And you're right, as we know. There will come a day when it will blow apart. Okay, so. All things have been created through Him and for Him. So we begin with that. Why did God in His fullness create the earth, the universe, and man? For Himself. Now, at this beginning point, we can conclude that God did this because it pleased Him to do so. He wanted to do it. That still leaves us with questions, of course, and it's certainly not the complete answer, but it's a starting point. He chose to do it. It brought Him pleasure to do it. That is, with joy, he created the universe, the earth, and man. And in this alone, 
we can already sense the disruptive dissonance of original sin. It brought God pleasure to do something He had never done before that we know of. It's not recorded that He ever did this before. We take it on faith that He's never done this before. But since He lived in eternity past, who knows? Maybe we're the second iteration. We're the 2.0. I doubt it. He created a universe outside of himself and his own dwelling, and in that universe he created something particularly special to him, human beings. Not as an afterthought, not as insignificant playthings to observe from afar, like as as a child amuses himself watching a bunch of ants on the ground. No, we will see in the early Edenic days that God created man in his own image to have a relationship with his maker. But in even those earliest days, man will turn against his maker, relinquishing his sweet fellowship with God for Satan's lies. Boggles the mind, but he did it. This was not just a mistake. This was not just a stumble, but represented a cosmic tear in the fabric of creation. I believe it was something akin to what happened on the cross. In fact, even as the temple veil was being torn in two, the death of Christ was repairing the damage done by Adam and Eve in the garden. His death meant that man would now have an opportunity to break from the consequences of that first rebellious sin. God's purpose... behind His creation goes far beyond just doing it because it pleased Him to do it. As mentioned earlier, this creation, both the act and the product, that is, both the creative genius of the act itself and the product, that which had been created, the universe, the earth, human beings, animals, don't forget the animals, will be intended, all of that will be intended to bring glory to Him. Edwards does the legwork for us to associate the phrases for Him, for example, Colossians 1.16, for my own sake, and even my name, associating these phrases with God's ultimate end, His glory which we see illustrated so well in Isaiah 48. Turn there, please. Isaiah chapter 48. This is a a great passage for this. Isaiah 48. Let's read verses 9 to 11. Note the emphasis there. For my own sake. For my own sake. He takes us by the shoulders and shakes us. For my own sake, I do this. What, what is he doing for his own... Oh, okay, I'm going to ask a question. I don't do this very... I'm going to ask a question. Take it easy. <laughs> what is he doing or not doing for his own sake there in that context? Patty. Yeah. 
Let's just go with wrath for now. Yahweh would curb His rightful wrath against Israel. Look at verse 8 just above. Indeed, He says, you have not heard. Indeed, you have not known. Indeed, even from long ago, your ear has not been open. Because I knew that you would deal very treacherously. And you have been called a transgressor from the womb. From the womb. Now, after saying that, what does he say? But I'm, not, I'm holding back my wrath. Why? For my own sake. For me, I'm doing it. Yet in spite of this, in spite of that, he does not release the fullness of his anger. And he still has not. He's still holding back his wrath. The fullness of his anger against Israel. When he does, what will that look like? Well, read Revelation chapter 6 through 16 for a description of the seven year tribulation, a crescendoing symphony of misery on earth. Misery we cannot even imagine, culminating in its third movement with the seven bowls or plagues of God's wrath. Specifically called it God's wrath poured out on earth. A period of hideous suffering, bizarre suffering accompanied by massive geographic upheaval. This earth will be destroyed. There will then be poured out the last of the seven bowls. Let me read verses 17 to 21 of Revelation 16. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. And a loud voice came out of the sanctuary from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. And the great city, that is Jerusalem, was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Babylon, the great, was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the wrath of his rage. And every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about one talent each, That is, about 100 pounds each. Came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe indeed. Oh, throughout history, God would chastise, He would punish, He would deliver Israel off to a foreign land. He might even, to a limited extent, destroy or kill. But the full measure, what we see pictured here in Revelation 16, the full measure of God's wrath will be restrained until the last things, the very last things. And that long-suffering restraint will be for one reason, for His glory. Now, I've left time for any thoughts or questions. We may even get out early if there aren't any, but I thought better than trying to cram this into all in one session. Yes, ma'am. He made the statement, He created us in His image. Will you sometime during this time talk about that? You think? (laughs) Yeah. I won't take us into there now or ask for an answer. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's always... I can't envision that, and I'd love to see it unpacked in a way that I could understand it, so I'll wait. After next session, verse 1. <laughs> and yes, we will get there in due time. Pro- probably in... Huh? 
Well, we talked about that last week. You were here. Remember? <laughs> People tend to do that in my classes. <laughs> well, I'm just going to forget this. This was, this was just horrible. <laughs> uh, on the one hand, I, showed, I revealed evidence that God's dwelling place First off, it is outside of our plane of existence. You can go as far as you like. You're not going to find it. It's there. It's material. It's substantial. But it's not on our plane. <clears throat> the question was, the, the, if he was in eternity past, what, what did that look like? Who, who was in eternity past? God. The Godhead. Trinity was heaven. And I made the case that heaven, his dwelling place, was eternal as well. That it had nothing to do, still has nothing to do with this universe. But then later on, and I forget the passage, I don't have good retention, but it's the passage, it it was one of the prophecies, probably Isaiah or... You want me to read it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I wondered, because it seemed to contradict maybe the point that you made Yes, like, and, I, I, and I admitted that. Yeah, go ahead, read it, please. It was Nehemiah 6, but I think, is that the whole? Okay, that's all that was. <clears throat> right. It was just a few verses. Right. You are Yahweh, you alone. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worship. And I took from that 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 seemed to suggest that God at some point, if heaven, if his dwelling place existed prior to the creation of the, the creation account in our Bible, well, then before that, earlier than that, he created all the beings, all the angels, the various angels. Uh, so I took from that from the way that verse reads, that there must have been a point where it was just the Godhead. Now, dwelling where? Nothingness? And I, I referred to the description in Revelation right before the great white throne when there's nothing. Everything is gone. Heaven and earth, gone. Christ on His throne, nothing. Not space, nothing. Nothing. And I think that would have, would also describe eternity past. But at some point, it says he created the angels, the, their, the hosts. That's what you forgot from last week. That's why you get the notes. Well, and my point with the, this session and the next is that reading John, I almost brought Edwards with me to read a paragraph to prove it. You read it and you, you just, your, your brain just swells and you read it again and you read it again and uh, it's almost painful and Piper does a good job of helping us understand that. He'll, you know, he'll take it paragraph by paragraph, and he'll, he'll say this, and then it'll be footnotes and, and this. So uh, <clears throat> it is very helpful, but even Piper, you've got to read a few times to digest, at least I do. Uh, so the reason I wanted to split this up to leave plenty of time to digest it, cause, and next week will be worse than this week. This week, I think we can pretty much all say, yeah, yeah, amen, brother, preach on. Next week, it gets a little dicey. Um, this whole idea that, for example, next week, God is glorified in our sin, our rebellion against Him. Now, I'm going to dig into that and explain it. 
It doesn't just stop there. It isn't, he is not glorified by our sin. But when we sin and He graciously forgives us, then He's glorified. See? But along with Paul, we quickly have to say, does that mean I should keep sinning? May it never be. No, no. But God and His Christ... God, man was created to glorify God. The universe was created to glorify God. And that in human beings is a despicable character trait. To do everything to be glorified. In our God, it's proof of His righteousness, of His rightness, of His character. Be- that, yeah. We don't deserve. It, it's an illusion to suggest that we deserve to be worshipped or that we are uh, worshipful, uh, and it's not with God. That's right. Uh, and we we continue to do with God what what plagues us in trying to understand Him continually, and that is we try to humanize Him. We try to. Mm-hmm. Use God, put God in the perspective of mankind, and then say, "Well, he must be a really good man. You know, he's the best <laughs> man I've, I've heard about so far." And that just does such an injustice uh, to, to trying to understand who God is. Well, this is what Jonathan Edwards spends pages and pages and pages saying, showing, and uh, and it's a remarkable. It, People are not smarter today than they used to be. Jonathan Edwards was a lot smarter than anyone in this room, believe me. And so you you do 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 diligence to try to understand him. It's worthwhile. But that's what he spends chapters explaining that God, because of his character, has to <clears throat> has <clears throat> excuse me has to acknowledge the best the highest well who's the highest god himself so he must he has to glorify himself because he has to glorify the highest <clears throat> excuse me were in the 1600s in the beginning but uh, uh, But Spurgeon was a Puritan so they continued I mean it wasn't uh, I I think so he he was just a a remarkable man uh, and very intelligent but his what we most people know him from his great sermon uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God um but he was very intellectual and uh as soon as as soon as i broached to the pastor this teaching this he says well <clears throat> got to read jonathan edwards and you might want to read piper along with him <clears throat> and i did uh, uh but it's and it's one thing to try to understand it. It's, it's another thing to sift that down and teach it. There must be somebody who is deciphering Piper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I haven't met him yet. <clears throat> I remember when uh, Pastor Andrus uh, taught, when he was teaching in the, in the fireside room, uh, 
he, if one one of his classes was one of John Piper's books, and I got the book and I read it, and I thought, "Oi, <laughs> no, 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 no." John Piper John Piper is a lot easier to listen to in his sermons than it is to read him. I, it's for me, maybe some people it's the same as a comic book. It isn't to me. Okay. So next week we will continue with this. And again, not because they're so wonderful, but just so that you get it, so that you can, I mean, sometimes you have to read it a couple of times. The notes are freely available. You can get them. You can, I can send them to you. So, Father, you've given us much to chew on here. We sometimes have to work at it. Some things do not come easy. We need your help. We need your spirit to help us understand this. And we cry out to you, please help us. Because this is important. And it's wonderful. In Jesus' name, amen.